Betsy Lobmeyer. She's the library media specialist at FIMAL. Betsy, I know you're back there. Come stand by me. <laughs> Betsy applied for a grant through the American Association of School Librarians. And it was the first year for this particular grant. And she, with some of her kids, put together their proposal. She carried out her plan and submitted it and was chosen from all the applications that went in. It was the first year for the award and so all the time it was Betsy Loebmeyer wins it. You know? And when I saw Betsy Loebmeyer's name come over the web page for the American Association of School Librarians, I thought, oh, how many Betsy Loebmeyers can there be? <laughs> Luckily there's one and I know that one. So she, here's what the award is. It's the Roald Dahl Miss Honey Social Justice Award. The grant recognizes AASL members who have collaboratively designed a lesson, event, or course of study on social justice. It is donated and sponsored by the Penguin Random House. The award includes $2,000 to the recipient. $5,000 to the school library, and $1,000 in travel expense. So she and her husband traveled to Las Vegas, I know. <laughs> and she had her moment in the spotlight, and she had the room in tears. It was a packed room, because it was a lot of different awards, and she was toward the end, and there were people with their tissues doing this, and people doing this because they had goosebumps. So Betsy's going to share a little bit with you on what her collaborative <coughs> project was. All right, so mostly you need to know that I wouldn't be able to do any of this if I didn't have amazing teachers that I'm working with, because I got this idea at the end of March, and I come into them and say, hey, let's do a giant project next month when you have a million other things going on. So. Kim Vanetta in fourth grade, and Jillian Algram, who was in third grade last year, she's in second grade this year, and Kelly Gerber, who was at sixth grade at Playmail last year, and now she's at St. Dominic. They have just amazing and, and said, yes, we'll work together, and they, they brought their kids in, and we brainstormed, and we planned, and we wrote menu activities, and Christy said, that sounds great, keep going, and without that, without a, the spirit like that, where the library and the school is working together all the time, we wouldn't be able to do any of this. So that's the first thing. My name's on all of it, but it's those ladies who are working with us to make sure that we're really doing what we can for kids. But Christy said that I have to tell you some of my remarks that I gave in Las Vegas. So I just amend it a little bit, because there's a lot of thank yous to Penguin Random House and stuff like that. But I'll tell you basically what I said, which was, one of the biggest joys, one of the greatest joys of this project was watching the students' imaginations just ignite. It's impossible to read Charlie and the Chocolate Factory without feeling cold and hungry, and without seeing Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory in your mind's eye. And once students make that leap to imagining things, it's not hard for them to then think about a cold prison in the Andes Mountains where there are babies who live with their mamas and don't have blankets and toys. 
And once that imagination is ignited, then the heart hungers for action. And the kids were thrilled to be able to make blankets for those kids. We made 33 blankets tied with fleece and embroidered <coughs> flannel blankets. Mrs. Benetta taught all those kids how to do simple embroidery stitches, and they stitched peace and faith and hope, or peace and faith and love in Spanish on the corner of the blankets. So paz and fe and amor, because those were nice short words, on the corners of the blankets. And we sent those away. And they're not there yet. They're still en route, because you can't send things to the post office to Ecuador. But um, they're going down in suitcases. I think that Roald Dahl knew that about imagination that once you wake up someone's heart and someone's imagination, because the, the worlds in his books are so vivid. They have beautiful vocabulary, really great for teachers. They have vivid pictures. The, the villains are very, very bad. And they invite children to look at the real issues in front of them. How should kids treat each other? How should adults treat children? What are the choices and possibilities in our own lives? One of the early scenes in the book, Grandpa Joe tells Charlie, sometimes what you imagine comes true. And I imagine that every time a child reads a good book, it shapes them into the person that they were meant to be. This project showed that that is true. I imagine that we as librarians and teachers get every day the chance to lead kids to those books and, and help shape them into being those people. And that every day, teachers and librarians can change the world. So that's why this sort of project was really exciting for us, because that's what we want as teachers and librarians, to work together and build kids who are going to go out and make the world a better place. So I really would need to thank Kim and Kelly and Jillian and Christy and all the kids and all of you for giving us the flexibility <coughs> to do things like this and see the great things that come out of it. But I want the kids to talk to you too, so I brought three kids, and they have some pictures of their blankets, and they're just going to come and spread out and tell you a little bit about what they did. So Macy and Kylie and Anna, come here. Bring your pictures.
pretty good. Like a notification with the Facebook watching Betsy's um, adventure here over the summer in Las Vegas. Um, she and her husband are posting Miss Honey Justice, the hashtag, and so that's her nickname around school. Obviously, we've only been in school for less than two weeks, so most of these images are from last year, but these are just some of the things that are going on at Pine Mill. <coughs> Our 
Alliance of India. Thanksgiving dinner where we served 120 parents for lunch. That's me. So. Again, we just want to thank you for your time. We've already used that 15 minutes. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to update you on the progress made the board goal 1.5 that relates to student readiness and parent communication. And I'm going to update you first on the progress we've made with first and second grade readiness, followed by a report from the teachers who worked on third grade readiness. And then we've done a little bit, I've got some teachers here who have 
worked with some grade level meetings. They volunteered to do some of this on their own. And I would like for them to share with you how that's going and how that kind of relates to that parent communications piece. But as you're aware, we are in the second year of a three-year pilot for first grade readiness. We reported in April that we had fewer retentions than ever before, more consistency in data collection, and qualitative data that we are meeting with parents more frequently. In May of last year, Dr. Ava, Dr. Dennis, and I met with every principal and looked at the rubrics for every student that was being retained. We talked about the student, we talked about the interventions that the student had been getting, and um, we talked about the <coughs> sessions that had been held. We also met with the kindergarten team at the end of the year to make any changes to the rubric that they felt needed to be made. And at the end of the year, they suggested two changes that they would like to make to the rubric. One of them was on the developmental reading assessment that assesses fluency and comprehension. They felt like we were giving credit, too much credit to students um, who were not really reading. So at that point, we eliminated the level A. It goes from A to three, and we want students to be at about a three in kindergarten before they move on. We decided to eliminate the A and not give that any points at all. And then we made some slight adjustments to the um, AIMS web assessment. Then at the beginning of this year, as they were talking about their beginning of the year in service with Engage New York, they realized when they looked at the rubric that they were asking students to, um, to recognize numbers to 20 and to um, write numbers, or recognize numbers to 100 and write numbers to 100, and Engage New York really only had the criteria of going to 20. Well, they didn't know how much time they were going to have this year to be able to get to the 100, if they were going to be able to get all students to 100, so they decided as a group that they would like to move that back to 20. But they also said, not that we're going to change our expectations for kids. We've always had the expectations that our kids can count to 100, they can write to 100, they can recognize numbers to 100. We're still going to have that expectation, but we may not get all kids there. So it was their decision that they wanted to move that back. Um, this will be the first year of the first grade pilot. And I can tell you that teachers have already, or student, teachers have already been talking with their parents at Open House. They've been talking about the rubrics and been holding parent meetings to discuss the readiness rubrics for the first grade for the first graders. And so this evening we have a group that's been working on second grade readiness, and they're going to present to you what criteria they have put in place. So I'm gonna let them do it. You guys want to recognize yourselves? And, okay. Um, I'm Sarah Crofts. I teach at AP. I'm Jillian Algram and I teach at Carmel. I'm Linda Panch and I'm at Jenny Wilson. Yes, I'll let you take over. Okay, so our goal for this was to <coughs> put structures in place to ensure that all students are third grade ready. Um, we followed the three questions that the kindergarten and the first grade committees followed. So as we were working, we asked ourselves, what should second grader students know and be able to do? Um, then we asked ourselves, how will we know if uh, they have learned these things? And what are we willing to do if they have not learned these things? So that's kind of work. Here's the rubric that we came up with, and it looks exactly like the K-1 rubric did. Um, we kept phonics. We have a screener for that um, that'll screen them on their phonic skills. DRA, fluent, um, AIMS web, those are tests that we give anyway. Vocabulary skills, and we wanted to not test them on specific vocabulary words, but to test them on like prefix suffixes, the same, the skills that they need to be able to decode the words rather than decode the meaning of the word. Um, changing it to an opinion piece because that's what Common Core focuses on in second grade. Yeah, second grade. <laughs> and then math. Three digit numbers, subtraction within a thousand, time, money, and problem solving. We also, uh, we also have these rubrics starting this year in, um, at conferences, and the teachers will be talking to the parents, getting this ready for them so that they've already seen. Um, how will we know if they have learned it? Um, Sarah talked, to, or Amber talked about some of these things. Um, the quick phonics screener, Ames Web, reading and math, the DRA, writing rubrics, math assessments, and then problem solving. 
Um, some of these things were created by our committee um, just to make sure we're assessing the things that we need to from the rubric. Um, in alerting parents, we have these things, which so did K1 and, or K1. Um, so there's the brochure over here, and then the flip charts, and these things will be discussed with parents at conferences. What are we willing to do if they have not learned it? Well, our expectations are that all students will have received first quality education every day they are in school. We also expect that students have access to quality explicit targeted interventions at school. Each school uses the Ames Web, puts kids into interventions as needed, and those interventions, we have a protocol that uses research-based interventions with those students. Once they have mastered that skill, they are moved out of the intervention. And um, we expect parents to help as well. Okay, one of the things they did this year, we decided that we were going maybe a little bit too fast. We had um, developed first, second, or third grade readiness last year, but they weren't really ready to implement it this year because we were also changing the report card, which we will share with you at a later time. So they decided to back up a little bit and use the rubrics, but not really change the report card this year. We changed the, the kindergarten report card shows um, indicator-based readiness rubrics. The first grade report card this year also looks at essential criteria for students to have. We're not going to change the second grade report card until next year. That way, when we have a parent who has gone through with their kindergartner, now this year with their first grade or seeing that new report card, next year they will see it again when they have a second grade student. So anyway, they're going to use the rubrics this year and teach with them and share with the parents, but they're not going to change the report card until next year. So. Anyway, I would also now like to bring the group up to talk about parent communications and what they're doing to support that piece because that, we know that that is a very important part of what we're doing with the parents. Last year, to address the parent communication piece, we formed a kindergarten club and it was a grade level meeting once a month after school. Our primary goal at each meeting was to discuss how we were sharing information with parents. Teachers were able to sign up on my learning plan to uh, get points for coming to the meeting, and we generally had a pretty good turnout. Wow, this year is expanded. We've gone K-4 with the interventionists also going to join us. So we are very excited about this and have a great team of uh, teachers that are working together and we're, we've um, set some agenda items in common and we've also left it open for our items that pertain to our particular grade level. But we um, were determined to cover parent communication at each meeting. We've had pretty good turnout so far. Our last meeting was um, last week, actually our first for the year, and we averaged 20 to 25 teachers from each grade level. There's a lot of interest in collaborating and working together, so we're very excited about it. This is all volunteer. They called, they contacted me last year and said, would you mind if we did this? And it's like, okay, no, this is great. And how often are the meetings? Once a month. Once a month. Do you have any <laughs> questions? Kind of feedback for you all get from the parents. The parents, um, last year with kindergarten, we stressed different ways to talk with the parents, and I think we shared some at a board meeting, some newsletters, uh, homework agenda item that they needed to sign, and some calendars that they could sign, as well as catching the parents right there, home visits, calling them on the phone, seeing what we could do. Um, the parents have not been coming to these meetings. These meetings have been for the teachers to right. get together at a grade level. As you increase your interaction with the parents, what kind of feedbacks are you seeing? What, I mean, what are they saying to you? Well, I think 
parents are starting to learn and understand better about how to get their child prepared and they're starting to ask some better questions and they're starting to seek resources and realize places where they can get it I would say is one thing I've seen and I can say I thought I'm a looping teacher so I took my kids from kindergarten to first grade and um, last year I showed them the rubrics and the brochures and we met frequently talking about the kids and if they were struggling and I had a few that we thought I would retain but then they succeeded and were successful so I promoted them to first with me and so then at the open house when I showed them the first grade rubrics and all of that um, they were so comfortable with it they didn't seem nervous they didn't seem surprised they're like oh I know exactly what you're talking about no I understand we're going to communicate about it and so they were on board and excited and so I think that parents are really starting to understand so that's exciting I'm sorry which school are you I'm at AP Hubert okay These meetings that you were talking about, first through fourth grade, they're for teachers, not parents? They're for their teachers, that's right. And kindergarten meets all together, and first grade teachers meet all together, second, third, and fourth. And um, Abe Hubert hosted the last meeting, which was really great. In September, we're excited that the math teachers <coughs> are going to come for the first half hour of our meeting and then address questions that we, we as teachers have with the new Engaged New York Math program. And so that would be our agenda item, parents, communication, engage New York. And then at each grade level, we're asking for agenda items from the teachers. They email us agenda items. So then that leaves us half of the time, or maybe a little bit less, to address things particularly to our grade level. What discussions did you guys have last time at your last meeting about how to communicate with parents? I know I talked to Brandy a little bit about that this evening. Um, yeah, it was actually really exciting because I think, you know, as a teacher, you have a lot of ideas on ways to communicate with parents. But what was neat was I heard, heard some great ideas. Um, like one school had said that they were meeting with parents before and after school 20 minutes so parents could just sign up and meet with them. Um, they also talked about um, open house, which we all have um, at the beginning of the year. And they also talked about, um, I think it was Dojo. Dojo? Yeah, it's Class Dojo. A lot of the um, teachers were communicating with parents that way, so that was exciting, something I, went, I thought I'd look into. So it was just nice to see different things that people are doing. They're like, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. So I just think that collaboration is really good. What is, what is Dojo? <laughs> <laughs> Class Dojo is a, it's a computer program. It's free. Teachers can sign up their classes for it, and they can monitor the behavior. Um, if students are working hard or using persistence, teamwork, they can do positive and they can do negative, and then the parents can go on and look it up and see how their child did that day. And then at the end of the week, they can have like a, a, a pie chart that shows the percentage of positive and negative behaviors that the student had. There's an app for it. There's an app for it, <laughs> yes. <laughs> at the kindergarten level, a group of parents meets with together a real basic PowerPoint that provides the rubric information and we'll have it translated into Spanish and English and then uh, for a means if we could and um, then that would be shared with all the kindergarten teachers in the district and then they could have a parent night in their building and then the parents could come and uh, there would be a presentation that they could see. Theo was very successful last year in doing that and we did it at Buffalo Jones, and it was it was a great it was a great thing for us too. So we are hoping to get that done before the end of September, so that we could have a parent night before first conferences. So we had a chance to meet them at open house and share the rubrics and the brochures again at open house, and then we would have a parent meeting. And hopefully, if all the buildings are able to do that, a parent meeting and then conferences. So we've got three really good ways to connect with the parents. Um, these sides are one of them. And the goal behind the PowerPoint was so some of the information could stay consistent throughout the district and, and also to kind of help with the workload. We got a great group at kindergarten. Um, we, I think it's because we had a year to gel. We're ahead. A year ahead of the others, yeah. but um, sharing information, PowerPoints, and things that we're doing district wide kindergarten on our email. So um, we're hoping to really keep that ball going and keep our sharing and communication with teachers going as well as our sharing and communication with parents going. Um, I did have a couple of questions. Um, one of the Parents, how much do you expect parents to provide the, the help to the 
guys give some examples of, you know, the end of the year last year when you had a student aid leading to kick it in a little bit and how you partnered with parents on that? Well, I know one thing I did is um, I through Kiwanis, you could get a grant, and I asked for some money to put together sideboard bags. And then I collected up materials to put in the bags. I had a parent night so they could come in and see what the kind of games were. And then I sent those home at the end of the school year for the kids to take home and work with. And I also included simple things like just like a, a journal with a pen they could write with, with, you know, and little kindergartner stuff. That was the coolest thing ever. And like a little activity pad and some crayons. And to, just to kind of um, keep them doing some things that are school-like. Um, I know for one student that I had that was struggling, and she was one that I did the rubric on and I was concerned with, so I met with parents and initially we had talked about, you know, um, I was concerned about possible retention, I will be doing this rubric on her, I was explaining all this, everything to her, but what I did was I went through all my assessments and I looked at what she was struggling in, what specific skills, and so then when I visited with mom and dad, I said, these are the skills she's struggling with, um, sight words is one of them, or in math, it was, you know, she's unable to write her numbers or she cannot recognize her numbers. And so I was like, are you willing to um, help her at home? You know, do you have um, the ability to be able to help her? And they were definitely on board. They were excited. They wanted to help her. And so what I would do is I would just get a bag full of all the stuff that they needed. And I provided everything they needed with the paper, the pencil, the crowns, everything they needed. I made the sight word cards and then I would send them home and when she had mastered that then I had filled the bag with new stuff and um, it worked because she's in first grade with me and I think the parents seen how proud they were and how proud I was and how excited she was and us working together as teamwork is I mean that's success I thought I was really excited. So, so is it correct that for most situations where you need just an extra help or, or do you have the parents doing this constantly? I would say the bulk of it is your high school. I mean our explicit intervention, like Linda Finch was saying, our explicit intervention is at school. That's where they get the most. I would say at home. parents to reinforce what they're doing at school, just to practice what they're doing. Yeah. It's like a support more than anything. I wouldn't say it's so. Along with that, what I was wondering is, in your experience, um, do you, are you able to determine whether our majority of our parents have both the time and, and um, I guess, the academic interest to, to provide the kind of support that you're expecting from our parents? Or, I know we have a lot of parents Um, one thing I started this year was um, every morning I have my kids write in a morning journal and so on Fridays I'm having them write a Friday reflection and so they can tell about anything they've learned during the week, <coughs> how they've had good behavior, how they've helped someone during the week and then on Fridays they've been taking the journals home and their parents or older brother or sister or aunt or someone who is at home with them and can help them. Um, just write something back to them about their entry. So um, I've had it be in Spanish or English, and I said, as long as the kids can tell me what it says, then that was fine. <laughs> um, so I just have a lot of parents that are really interested in just writing that, you know, and even if it has to be after the kids go to bed or if it has to be, um, you know, when they're not up in the morning, they're still able to write to their student and then the kid can read it and then you know, have that communication, just like there is an interest in their students, even if they can't be there all the time whenever the kids, you know, awake or all that. So it's really worked well for me so far. child's 
learning on the interventions that they received, and it will be a decision made between the teacher, the parent, and the administrator at the end of the year. It will be a group decision whether to retain that child or pass them on. Um, chances are, by the time they're in second grade, and they may or may not have passed kindergarten, first grade, if they get to second grade, they're going to be in interventions. They're, we're all going to be working together. It's going to be a constant communication between everyone to decide what to do with this student who is still struggling. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that there's a parent in I just think we have such a diverse student population that's important to recognize that all our students come from a variety of different home situations where they may get a lot of help or maybe not too much. So I do like the fact that, that we're um, laying these things out and that the students, students in all the schools will have you know, similar instruction and continue to advance. So that's good. Um, on the, particularly on the earlier ages like kindergarten, um, how has the rubric been adjusted or how have we incorporated some of those um, sort of intangible professional judgment aspects of is this child socializing? Uh, you know, to what extent it's getting in the way of performance on, say, tests? And the other aspect of that are how deep are we in alternatives for some of our data sources for the rubric? I mean, for instance, a child can perform on a time test differently than an untimed test. Um, you know, we have different ways in which they learn. You guys are the professionals. How have we addressed that? For kindergarten and present, we don't have a social admission. Um, for the time test, in SWED is a time test for letters and for the sounds of the letters, but then we also test them one-on-one -on -one with no time constraints. So they do have a one-minute time test that's scored, and then they also have uh, an untimed test where they have time to think. Um, the time just gives us an idea of how fluent they are, <coughs> and the untimed is do they, you know, can they recognize this number maybe or this letter? Maybe they have a little, they need a little bit more time. So the time issue is addressed in both measures. The DRA is not time, but there is a fluency component to see if they're struggling over the words. When the fluency goes down, the comprehension goes down. But it measures the comprehension and the accuracy of what they're reading, which words they're getting correct and which words they're missing. And also, are they understanding? They're learning. So we've tried to use some measures that look at different different ways that the child is learning. If they struggle on the times test, for the times test, there are other measures. And so that wouldn't be the one thing that held them back. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm kind of, I'm, I guess I'm trying to wrap my mind around how we take sort of, since this is a mandatory promotion, mandatory retention tool, it seems wise to allow input by the professional teacher parent relationship there at the local school. And I'm just trying to wrap my mind around how we take something that's an absolute and apply some of those intangibles into the rubric that ultimately becomes an absolute. They have to be promoted or they have to be retained. And I guess sort of a related question to that, is there any downside to an absolute must using that rubric? Well, it does take away some parent and teacher judgment. But on the other hand, um, it's everything's very clear. It, like on the one student I had to have the meeting on, you know, I kind—I of, was really kind of fearful of the meeting, and I kind of decided I'll just speak unless I'm spoken to. But you know, we were able to, you know, look at the rubric, and we were able to tell the parents, hey, you know, here he's really close here. Maybe if you could work on him with counting, 
or maybe if you could work with him on writing his numbers, maybe that will help him get that score up enough he can go on. And then the counter to that, of course, is what if the score is high enough, but there's concerns by the parent about mandatory promotion? I mean, is that something that can be approached before we get to that decision date? And there's got to be a basis for that concern. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes those are intangible. Uh, not the feeling, but the judgment of that aspect of the child. And, and so just wanting to support that important teacher-student relationship and the supporting staff that supports that teacher, how do we weave that in to the rubric, or do we want to? And to the extent we don't want to and don't make provision for it, then it's a cold, hard, see you in the next class. Which can be fine, if, particularly if we're, what's the word, teachers moving on to the next class or the same class? Looping. Looping, thank you. Um, that might be just fine. But well, I'm just wondering. Lots of communication, like between the kindergarten and the first grade, at least at Edith Sharman. So, you know, um, like the first grade teacher that had some of mine that were really close, she knows who they are, and she knows that she needs to keep a close eye on them. And like their rubric can go on with them. So then that next teacher has a good idea of where those, some of those strengths and weaknesses are and maybe some areas that need to be concentrated on. So particularly if there's a concern, that's just simply communicated on the next teacher. Yeah. And I think we're hoping that we have enough safety in some place that we don't want to be able to help our kids. So. I was just going to say, I think what's important too is the consistency. because. We do have movement in the district, even though we do our best to not have that. And it's the same in every first grade or kindergarten classroom, regardless. So it's not that she says, oh, I feel this child should be retained. And I'm like, oh, I think they should be promoted. And I think that consistency of the rubric allows that child to move from building to building. And those parents and teachers know that this is what's expected and this is where, where we're going to go. And I think that's important, too. So it's a plus. Program is that early engagement and consistent standards. And we do reevaluate this at the end of the year. So this year, at the end of this year, we will look at our kindergarten with their PA again to see if there are anything, if there's anything we need to change. We'll also look at first grade to see if there's anything we need to change on that. So we continue to have these conversations and everything you're bringing up here we continue to discuss. So we work together with them. It's a great group of teachers. Thank you very much for your hard work and dedication.
it looks like we can have at least one more on technology. If anyone is interested, if you'd like to sign up sheet, let me know. Is there anything? And I'm on you guys. I'm going to send it down here. I, just to the I think you're the last one here, the last okay. one. So, if anyone has a chance to sign up for the board back in the weeks. Anything else for board? We've had a very smooth OP in the school uh, going in and then circling through the, the principals and the teachers and go work from maintenance to food service, so on and so forth. But we have had a glitch, and I've been able to talk to most all of you about it. Uh, we've got some problems in, in our transportation department. Kids are on the bus too long in the morning. And on the bus. Some kids are on the bus too long in the morning. Some are on the bus too long in the afternoon. We have some examples at our schools where uh, the buses are not able to arrive in a timely manner, so we've got some supervision issues before the buses can get there to pick the kids up after school. Uh, and, and, and the problem is a driver shortage. Uh, so I'm looking at uh, putting together a contracted service with uh, first student to bring five drivers in from Wichita starting uh, next Wednesday after Labor Day and contracting them on a week-to-week -week basis for 39 days up till November 1st. And uh, this should resolve the problem until we can hire some drivers. Uh, it might take anywhere from, we might hire a driver and they'll be able to go to work the next day. If we can, then we'll reduce that contract of service by one from five to four. Uh, then, uh, but some drivers, when we hire them, they take maybe three weeks to get them licensed to where they can step up and, and drive for our kids. But I, I want the board fully aware of what the community aware that there is a problem and it's due to a driver shortage and uh, it's something that we're, we're trying to remedy uh, and we're not taking it lightly. And there's some, many routes are running as smooth as they ever have, but there's some out there that's creating some situations, in my opinion, that's not good for kids and not good for families. If you have to sit on a bus two hours in the morning and two hours in the too long. We want that to be closer to an hour or less. And that's what we're shooting for. So do want you to know that we're working on that and probably there will be something come to the board. As I told you, the contract will come to the board for your approval September 8th. And we'll already have this in place. So because I consider this an emergency that needs to be addressed right now. So that's it. Are there any questions? First, first student, student. and Tim, you're the only board member I haven't got to talk to. I've talked to the rest of them, you and I haven't connected, so I'll gladly answer any questions you may have after the meeting. I just can't hear the name, so. First student, it's a national uh, service, a lot of school districts. Uh, they don't own their own buses, they contract that service. I know you, maybe I think you said that in your comments, but certainly not only sitting on the bus, but that whole supervision aspect, wherever the students are, there's, uh, there's some concern out there. So I think hopefully it would help people to know uh, this is considered a, an emergency and that you're, you've got a plan and, and that you're acting on it. Um, I know there's some parents that are trying to make adjustments in carpooling. Resources of the parents are always helpful. Um, so I'm glad that you're on top of it. And it should be noted that we've got teachers staying beyond their contract time. We've got teachers coming before their contract time. We've got principals on both ends of it, too. So there's a lot of people out there giving time to, to provide that supervision right now, but we can't, we can't continue to do that. We, we're either going to have to start paying for it or we're going to, uh, the, the best answer is to hire drivers. Yeah. That's
That's the best answer. And that was the fundamental reason for this crisis was just an unforeseen loss and change in number of drivers. You've got to have a certain number of drivers. Yeah, that's right, uh, Mark. Uh, but also, it's, it's a problem. It's a problem at Dodge. It's a problem at Liberal. It's a problem in most every school district that hires their own bus drivers right now for some reason. And there's a lot of demands today placed on a bus driver. Um, it's, a, it's a very demanding job, and it, it requires certain skills, and their licensure is increasing. You know, the rigor to get a license to drive a bus is increasing, not decreasing. presentation we heard is exciting to hear the collaboration of the teachers for implementing the curriculum and particularly I heard the, the New York I don't know, proper reach New York, engage New York on mathematics. Certainly heard a lot of feedback on on uh, that basically to me says there's a lot of opportunity for us to uh, find resources to play that critical role of helping the kids with their homework. And so uh, uh, I know the staff is on top of this. Uh, I, I want us as a board to think in terms of ways that we can support uh, that added support to the parents. Because uh, it's a new approach. And, and certainly I think we're in this uh, college and career ready for the long haul. got to tax the teacher. So it's good to hear the teachers have a, a process of collaboration there monthly, um, but the parents have daily homework to try to help with. And so um, I think that's a, a real need in the short term if we can find a way to do it. Dr. Dennis and uh, uh, Mrs. Roderick will, uh, on the agenda September 8th, will be presenting an update of where we are on Motion to adjourn. Power moves. Mark seconds. All in favor? 